What could possibly drive a nation to the brink of self-destruction, where neighbors turn against neighbors, friends against friends? Let's journey back to the heart of Africa, to the land of a thousand hills, Rwanda. In order to understand the Rwandan genocide, we must first delve into the historical background of this beautiful yet deeply scarred country. Rwanda, a nation pulsating with life and culture, is home to two main ethnic groups, the Hutus and the Tutsis. These two groups lived in relative harmony for centuries, their identities more of an occupational divide rather than ethnic. A Hutu was a farmer, a Tutsi, a cattle herder. Over time the lines blurred, and these distinctions became more about wealth and less about occupation. Then, the winds of colonialism blew over Rwanda. The Belgian colonizers in the early 20th century found it convenient to rule through the minority Tutsis, who they considered more European-like due to their relatively lighter skin and taller stature. They introduced identity cards, cementing the ethnic divide. The seed of discord was sown. In 1959, as the winds of African independence swept the continent, Rwanda was caught in its gust. A revolution erupted led by the majority Hutus overthrowing the Tutsi monarchy. The Hutus, now in power, institutionalized discrimination against the Tutsis, leading to waves of Tutsi refugees fleeing to neighboring countries. One group of refugees in Uganda formed the Rwandan Patriotic Front, a Tutsi-led rebel group. Their aim? To return to their homeland, end the discrimination, and establish a unified Rwanda. But their dream was far from the reality on the ground. The Hutu government, threatened by their existence, stoked the flames of ethnic hatred, painting the Tutsis as the enemy, the other. As the 90s dawned, these tensions were about to reach a breaking point. Every fire begins with a spark, and in Rwanda, that spark was a plane crash. In the evening gloom of April 6, 1994, a missile struck the aircraft carrying Juvenal Habyarimana, the president of Rwanda, and Cyprien Ntari Amira, the president of Burundi. Both Hutu presidents died in the crash, and the news spread like wildfire, igniting a fury of ethnic tension that had been simmering below the surface. The assassination of President Habyarimana was the catalyst for the ensuing violence. The president, a Hutu, was seen as a symbol of unity for his ethnic group. His sudden death shattered the fragile peace between the Hutus and the Tutsis, the two major ethnic groups in Rwanda. In the aftermath of the crash, rumors and propaganda began to circulate. Radio broadcasts and print media, largely controlled by hardline Hutus, blamed the Tutsis for the assassination. The extremist radio station, Radio Television Libre de Mille Collines, or RTLM, was particularly instrumental in fanning the flames of hatred. They drove the narrative that the Tutsis were the enemy, that they were plotting to enslave the Hutus. This propaganda, tapping into deep-seated fears and prejudices, was a potent fuel for the fire that was about to consume the nation. The government, led by Hutu extremists, wasted no time in capitalizing on the chaos. They declared a state of emergency, establishing a crisis committee to maintain order. But their idea of order involved eliminating the Tutsi threat, and they began drawing up lists of Tutsis and moderate Hutus who they deemed enemies of the state. When the dawn of April 7 broke, it brought with it a chilling directive from the crisis committee. They ordered the Hutus to kill their Tutsi neighbors, the spark had become an inferno. Within hours a wave of violence would sweep across the country. Imagine a country where for 100 days the air is filled with the sounds of machetes and screams. A chilling thought, isn't it? Yet this was the terrifying reality for the people of Rwanda in 1994. The genocide was not a spur-of-the-moment event, rather, it was a meticulously planned operation, spearheaded by the Interahamwe a militia group comprised primarily of ethnic Hutus. These were not trained soldiers, nor were they foreign invaders. They were neighbors, friends, even family members, brainwashed into believing that the Tutsi population was an existential threat that needed to be exterminated. And so, they set to work with a brutal efficiency that is almost impossible to comprehend. Armed with machetes, clubs, and an unshakable belief in their cause, the Interahamwe went from home to home, village to village, leaving a trail of devastation in their wake. The scale of the violence was staggering, bodies littered the streets, rivers ran red with blood, and the once vibrant communities were reduced to ghost towns. Meanwhile the world watched in silence. The international community's response, or rather lack thereof, is one of the most contentious aspects of the Rwandan genocide. Despite the overwhelming evidence of mass killings, 
the United Nations and other global powers were reluctant to label the situation as genocide. This hesitation, this refusal to acknowledge the reality on the ground, effectively gave the green light for the slaughter to continue unabated. While the world hesitated, the Interahamwe did not. Day after day, night after night the killing continued. Men, women, children, no one was spared. The aim was not just to kill but to erase an entire ethnic group from the face of the earth. It was a campaign of extermination, fueled by a toxic mix of fear, hatred, and propaganda. And then, after 100 days, it was over. The genocide ended, not because of international intervention, but because the Rwandan Patriotic Front, a Tutsi-led rebel group, managed to seize control of the country. The Interahamwe were driven out but not before they had accomplished their horrific mission. In just 100 days approximately 800,000 lives were snuffed out, leaving a nation in ruins. But numbers no matter how large can never truly capture the human cost of the genocide. Each number represents a life cut short, a family torn apart, a future destroyed. Each number is a testament to the depths of human cruelty, but also a reminder of our collective failure to prevent such atrocities. The Rwandan genocide is a dark chapter in human history, a testament to the horrifying consequences of unchecked hatred and fear. But it is also a story of resilience, of a nation's struggle to rebuild from the ashes, and of the world's belated attempts to make amends for its inaction. We owe it to the victims, and to ourselves, to remember what happened during those 100 days of hell. When the world finally awoke to the reality of what had happened in Rwanda, the response was a mix of horror and shame. The international community was staggered by the scale and speed of the tragedy. Governments and international bodies from Washington to Geneva were left red-faced, grappling with the fact that they had overlooked the warning signs and failed to intervene in time. Many voiced their condemnation of the atrocities, but their words rang hollow against the backdrop of their earlier silence. In the halls of the United Nations, a belated sense of urgency took hold. There was a unanimous agreement that the world had failed Rwanda, and that something must be done to address the atrocities that had occurred. The result was the establishment of the International Criminal Tribunal for Rwanda in November 1994. The tribunal was a landmark in international justice. For the first time, individuals were held accountable on the international stage for acts of genocide. The court indicted 93 individuals, including high-ranking military and government officials, business leaders, and media personalities, all of whom were believed to have played a key role in orchestrating the genocide. But the court was not without its critics. Many questioned its effectiveness, pointing to its slow pace and the limited number of convictions. Others argued that it was a form of victor's justice, focusing solely on crimes committed by the Hutus, while ignoring those committed by the Tutsi-led Rwandan Patriotic Front. In spite of these criticisms, the tribunal represented a significant step towards justice. It sent a powerful message to the world, that genocide, wherever and whenever it occurs, will not go unpunished. Yet, as the gavel fell on the final verdicts, one question lingered. Could justice ever truly be served for the victims of such an atrocity? The scale of the genocide was such that no court, no matter how thorough or impartial, could ever fully address the suffering that had been inflicted. Justice was sought for the victims but could it ever be enough? How does a nation heal from such a deep self-inflicted wound? This question loomed large over Rwanda in the aftermath of the genocide. The country was left to grapple with a legacy of violence and hatred, but also the urgent necessity of reconciliation. The road to reconciliation as one might imagine was not smooth sailing. It was fraught with challenges as the nation had to confront its past, seek justice and find a way to move forward. But Rwanda was determined. The government launched a series of initiatives to promote unity and reconciliation among its citizens, laying the groundwork for the healing process. One of these initiatives was the establishment of the Gakaka Courts. These were community-based courts, drawing on a traditional Rwandan dispute resolution mechanism. The Gakaka courts were tasked with trying the vast majority of genocide-related cases. This was a monumental task given that approximately 1 million people were accused of participating in the genocide. The courts provided a platform for victims to tell their stories, for perpetrators to confess their crimes, and for communities to bear witness. They were not without their criticisms and challenges but they played a crucial role in the process of justice and reconciliation. 
Parallel to the Gakaka courts, the government set up the Unity and Reconciliation Commission. This commission was tasked with fostering dialogue among Rwandans, encouraging them to confront their past, and promoting unity. It organized a range of activities such as community workshops, education programs, and public debates, all aimed at facilitating dialogue and understanding. Despite the enormity of the task, there have been successes. Today, Rwanda has made significant strides in rebuilding its social fabric. It has achieved considerable economic growth and made impressive progress in areas such as health and education. More importantly, the country has managed to foster a sense of unity and national identity among its citizens. But let us not forget, reconciliation is not an event, but a process. It is a journey that requires time, patience and commitment. There are still challenges to be overcome, wounds to be healed, and conversations to be had. The memory of the genocide still looms large, and its shadows continue to shape the country's present and future. Yet, the story of Rwanda's reconciliation is one of resilience and hope. It is a testament to the human capacity for healing and renewal. It is a reminder that even in the face of unimaginable atrocities, it is possible for a nation to come together, confront its past, and chart a new path forward. The road to reconciliation is long and fraught, but necessary for a nation to heal and move forward. Rwanda's journey is far from over, but its efforts offer valuable lessons for other nations grappling with their own histories of conflict and violence. The Rwandan genocide is a grim reminder of humanity's capacity for extreme violence, but also its capacity for resilience and reconciliation. As we reflect on the harrowing events that unfolded in 1994, it's crucial to remember that this was not just a spontaneous eruption of violence, Rather, it was the culmination of a long history of ethnic tension, stoked by political manipulation and societal division. The genocide was a calculated and brutal exercise in power, one that claimed the lives of hundreds of thousands in just a hundred days. However, even in the face of such horror and devastation, the resilience and spirit of the Rwandan people shone through. The road to reconciliation was not an easy one. It required a commitment to truth, justice, and a recognition of the humanity of every individual regardless of their ethnic background. The establishment of the Gakaka courts, the efforts to rebuild and reintegrate communities, and the tireless work of individuals and organizations to heal the wounds of the past, all speak to a nation determined to rise from the ashes of its traumatic history. The international response, or rather, the lack thereof, is a stark reminder of the world's collective failure to prevent and halt atrocities on such a massive scale. The silence and inaction of the international community during those hundred days of hell stand as a testament to the grave consequences of indifference and inaction. The lessons of the Rwandan genocide are far-reaching. They teach us about the dangers of dehumanization, the power of hate speech, and the catastrophic results of turning a blind eye to grave injustices. But they also remind us of the power of forgiveness, the strength of unity, and the indomitable spirit of humanity. In the end, the Rwandan genocide is a tragedy that must never be forgotten. It is a dark chapter in human history that we must reflect upon, learn from, and strive to prevent from ever happening again. Remembering the past, no matter how painful, is crucial in ensuring that such horrors are not repeated in the future.